Take a board game with a track consisting of individual spaces that you move around by rolling a dice. Throw in a few extra special cases such as miss a turn, go back three spaces and you have the traditional racing board game. A style of game that has not only shown remarkable endurance but has shaped and influenced western board game design literally for centuries. And by shaped and influenced I mean stimmied, restricted, stifled, held back, hobbled, impeded, hamstrung, clogged, shackled, undermined, gagged, muzzled, inhibited, brought to a standstill, and of course, The traditional racing board game has a lot to answer for, not least of which is how it became the template for European board game design for centuries despite having few redeeming features. And why is it still prevalent today? High profile modern games like Mousetrap and The Game of Life are just traditional racing games hidden under layers of gimmick and it's become such a part of our cultural consciousness that it's the default for generic board game in Google Images. So I guess the question is, how did we even get here? And maybe more to the point, is there anything we can even do about it? Now today I'm going to talk about three landmark games which think there is. Three games which think you can teach the metaphorical old dog new tricks. But first, a history lesson. You can actually trace the traditional racing board game back all the way to ancient Egypt. Now it might not look like it, but Senate is an early example, which means that the racing board game has been around as long as the board game itself. And then it appears in more recognisable forms in ancient India, with the games that, once the British had brought them back, became what we know today as Snakes and Ladders, Ludo and Parcheesi. But though Snakes and Ladders might be the most recognisable example of a traditional racing board game, it's not the game that's responsible for all those synonyms at the top of this video. That dubious honour goes to a game that you might not even have heard of. The Game of the Goose first appears in Italy in the 15th century, but it didn't take long for John Wolfe to bring it back and register it in London in 1597. And from the start, The Game of the Goose has everything you would expect from a traditional racing board game. It has a track with 63 individual spaces, and you move around those spaces by rolling a dice. And because The Game of the Goose is the first board game to have a recognisable theme, some of those spaces have what you could charitably call a passing acquaintance with geese. So square 6 is a bridge which moves you immediately to square 12 and square 31 is a well which if you land on it you have to either miss a turn or wait to be rescued by another player. And sure, I guess geese can cross bridges and fall down wells. But none of that matters because at that point it feels like the designer either ran out of goose space situations or just couldn't be bothered anymore. So square 42 is a maze and square 52 is prison, which mechanically works exactly the same as the well, but now it's a prison. Oh, and square 58 is death. And in the game of the goose, death means you have to go all the way back to the beginning and start over, but presumably you're now 40 to 50 squares behind everybody else. But to be fair to it, the game of the goose does actually have geese, which appear at regular intervals around the board and double your roll if you land on them. There's a goose on square 9, so if your first roll is a 9, you immediately move another 9 spaces to space 18, which is also a goose. And so you immediately move another 9 spaces to space 27, which is a goose. And if you know your 9 times table, you can probably see exactly where this is going. Any player whose first roll is a 9 moves straight to square 63 and immediately wins the game. It's a bad game. It's also a gambling game. 
So in 15th century Italy, the goose was seen as a symbol of good luck, which means that whoever invented the game of the goose probably had some idea that players weren't going to win according to skill, but rather the look of the dice. It's harder to know how much of this Game of the Goose players understood, since the accepted way to play it was for everybody to put in a wager, which they'd arbitrarily have to increase if they landed on a penalty space or a space another player was in. Having said that, there is some evidence that some Game of the Goose players understood the game a little too well. Gonzalillo, who was the court jester to King Philip II of Spain, said, God grant that he who made it may burn, for to the prince and the infanta and Louis Tristan I have lost forty scudi. But presumably in Italian. Oh no! So even in the context of gambling, the game of the goose is a bad game, albeit one that was incredibly popular. And part of its popularity was because it's very simple, and because it's impossible to be a good or a bad player, meaning you're not going to be crushed by a much more skillful opponent. But a much larger part of its success was thanks to the printing press, which made the Game of the Goose the world's first board game to be printed on paper, and consequently, and more importantly, made the Game of the Goose the world's first commercial board game. And so you can imagine what happened next. Let's just say that board game design essentially stopped for about 300 years while Europeans got really good at drawing geese. In fact, the whole thing didn't run out of steam until well into the 1800s, by which point goose illustrations had gotten so elaborate that Game of the Goose players were taking regular trips round the insides of geese. But by then, printers had worked out that you could retheme the Game of the Goose as anything you could imagine, and so it turned up as everything from a journey around Europe to the life of a man from birth to death. The Victorians, of course, sucked whatever fun they could find out of it, turning the Game of the Goose into things like the Mansion of Happiness, an instructive moral and educational amusement. An exhilarating tour through Christian morality which rewarded players for landing on spaces such as piety and honesty, and punishing players for landing on squares such as cruelty and audacity. The Mansion of Happiness truly was an instructive moral and educational amusement. But it's all still just the game of the goose. In fact, about the only innovation the Victorians brought was the numbered spinner, which replaced the game's dice. Because dice meant gambling. And gambling meant sin. F Victorians. So because for a long time European board game design was just the game of the goose but something else, it was inevitable once we got to the 20th century the board game designers would look at the bicycle and look at the motor car and then look back at the traditional racing board game and put two and two together. Unfortunately, in this case, 2 plus 2 does not equal 4, despite the fact that they both have a track and they're both obviously about racing, the traditional racing board game and racing itself don't have a lot in common. And that's because the skill, endurance, concentration and fitness that you need to race a motor car, a motorbike or a bicycle don't transfer well to a style of game that's little more than roll a dice and move a playing piece. And yeah, you could argue that spaces such as Miss a Turn have some thematic relevance that you can play around with, but what does go back three spaces or move directly to square 12 mean in the context of racing? And this was all put into even more stark relief when the FIA standardised motor racing rules in 1946 and followed it up with the first Drivers' World Championship in 1950. Formula One solidified the idea of motor racing as a professional, difficult and dangerous sport, one which made superstars out of drivers like Juan Manuel Fangio and Alberto Ascari. Meanwhile, Another excellent game, well played. Dice! 
It's around this time that board game publishers start to experiment, trying to shape the traditional racing game into something more representative of actual racing. And one of the first games to come out of this experimentation was Waddington's Formula One, which gave players a dashboard and a speedometer. And with the speedometer, players could change their car speed in 20 mile an hour increments, which meant that players could now actually choose how far they wanted to move on their turn rather than relying on the roll of a dice. The caveat is that corners now have speed limits. If you exceed the speed limit, you roll a couple of dice and consult a chart to see what happens. If you're lucky, you might get away without a penalty, but more likely you'll incur tyre wear, or if you're really unlucky, you might spin off the track. Following Formula 1, we get games like Avalon Hill's Speed Circuit, which adds customization. Using a point system, players can now change things like their car's starting speed, top speed, its braking ability, and its resistance to wear. And so through the 60s and 70s, it seemed like this was the direction the traditional racing game was moving in, towards more accurate and realistic representations of actual racing. But then in 1980 came Niki Lauda's Formel 1s which is German for Niki Lauda's Formel 1s. Niki Lauda was a three-time Formula 1 world champion who suffered a near-fatal crash at the Nürburgring in 1976, a crash so severe he inhaled toxic fumes and suffered burns to the head that left him without most of his right ear, his eyebrows and his eyelids. Lauda came so close to death that he slipped into a coma and was administered the last rites in hospital. And then six weeks later, after missing only two races, he came back to finish fourth in the Italian Grand Prix and lost the championship that year by a single point. Niki Lauda's Formel Lines doesn't really capture any of this. It's a game in which you bid on the services of drivers and then gamble on them during the race itself. Designed by Wolfgang Kramer, Formel 1 has been released as Detroit Cleveland Grand Prix, Daytona 500 and again in 1997 as Top Race. And in testament to its enduring popularity and status as a landmark racing game, it was given a largely cosmetic update and re-released by Restoration Games in 2017. But Downforce, as it is now known and to which I'll refer to it for the rest of this video, actually began life as Tempo in 1974, an abstract game in which players would use hands of cards to move coloured pawns along a track and bet on the outcome of the race. Rethemed as a Formula 1 race, Downforce is something of an anomaly among racing games of this era, being as much an auction game and gambling game as it is a traditional racing game. Before the game starts, you'll shuffle this deck of cards and deal them equally to each player, and then you'll use the values on the cards in the game's auction, during which you'll bid for drivers to represent you during the race. And there's a lot of risk and reward involved in the auction. The more money you bid for a driver, the higher you'll need that driver to finish for your investment to pay off. So bidding a full $6 million for a driver means you'll need that driver to finish at least second if you want to make a profit. And there's no guarantee of that. During the race, you'll use the same cards and the same values to move the cards around the track, but you'll notice that a significant majority of the cards have more than one value on them. Playing these cards means you're not only moving more than one car on your turn, you're also moving them in order from top to bottom as they're printed on the cards. And since cars can't move over other cars, only around them, you're going to have to play carefully in order to try and get your own cars ahead while hindering your opponents by moving them into packs they can't get around or jamming them into bottlenecks at corners. But of course everybody else is doing exactly the same for their own drivers, which means you might reach a point at which you think you've made a bad investment. But that's okay. The first time somebody crosses one of the game's three checkpoints, everybody secretly bets on the outcome of the race. So you could potentially make more money gambling on the eventual winner than by trying to win the race outright. Sometimes in Downforce it makes more financial sense to help your rivals. Of all the racing games to come out of the 60s to 80s, it's Downforce which has stood the test of time, and it's done so largely by not really being a traditional racing board game. In fact, Downforce showed that to make the traditional racing game new and interesting, you had to shape it and mould it into something else, like an auction stroke gambling game for example. 
And so it seemed like the traditional racing game as popularized by the Game of the Goose all the way back in the 1500s had finally had its day. Or at least it did until 1997. Formula Day, known today as Formula D, is the natural successor to games like Waddington's Formula One and Avalon Hill's Speed Circuit, an unapologetically traditional racing board game which promises to fulfil the potential of those earlier titles. It's also more in every sense of the word. Why, asks Formula D, have any old racing track when you can have Monaco, the most prestigious circuit on the Formula One calendar? And why represent Monaco on one full-size board when you can represent it on two full-size boards? Why have one or two dice when you can have seven? Cars have 20 of them. Uh, ironically, considering how big everything else is in Formula D, the cars are actually tiny. But there really are 20 of them. Your game comes with a cardboard dashboard and a couple of flimsy dials. Why not have a fully functioning plastic gearbox with a movable gear stick you can shift up and down? And it's this gearbox that powers Formula D, which otherwise is just a game in which you take turns rolling a dice and moving your car. But with a gearbox, players now make a choice before taking their turn, either staying in their current gear or shifting into a different gear. And each gear is represented by a different dice. So in first gear, you're rolling a four-sided dice that moves you one or two spaces. But by the time you get to sixth gear, you're rolling a 20-sided dice, which moves you anywhere between 21 and 30 spaces. In answer to the obvious question, players are stopped from shifting up into six and staying there by Formula D's corners, each of which has a number. If you don't stop that many times during the corner, you'll take damage to your car, which usually means your tyres become more and more worn the more corners you miss, but you might just crash and probably die if you do something as dumb as take lows flat out in six. So this makes Formula D something of a push your luck game, one in which you're constantly weighing up the respective merits of staying in a higher gear and potentially overshooting corners, and shifting into a safer, lower gear, but with the risk of losing speed and momentum. It's this push your luck aspect that gives Formula D the potential to be, frankly, pretty silly. Then that's just the nature of games involving dice, so you can shift down to a gear to guarantee making the one stop you need, only to roll so badly that you don't even make it to the corner, and instead have to waste another turn crawling towards it while other players effortlessly sail past. And it's equally possible to watch players shift down to a perfectly reasonable gear, only to scream past around the outside two gears higher because of an unlikely and frankly undeserved roll. So you can add as many dice as you want and give players higher and higher degrees of control, but at the end of the day, you're still at the mercy of random chance. But in all fairness to Formula D, the game both fully understands how silly it can be and leans into it. If you flip over the board and your player card, you can race around a street circuit as one of 10 Fast and Furious rejects, each of whom have their own unique ability. You could be someone as generic as Jack Owens, who's good at drifting around corners, but you could also be Stanley Washington, who will rip out his radio and throw it at a nearby car if he hears a song he doesn't like. Formula D promises to be the definitive racing board game, and though it's often exciting and fun, and in specific moments it really does capture the feeling of being a racing driver, it never really fulfills that promise. And at this point, I'm not sure it's really trying all that hard anyway. Regardless, Formula D has been in print and largely unchanged for 23 years. And in that time, it's been pretty much unchallenged, coming to define the traditional racing game and at times be its sole representative. And that's largely because there never seemed to be the need for a challenger. By the time of its 2008 update, the traditional racing board game felt like a dead genre, outdated and forgotten, with Formula D representing both its zenith and its natural endpoint. It seemed as if the traditional racing board game had finally achieved everything it possibly could. And sure, there have been occasional attempts to bring the racing game back with Automobiles by AAG and Thunder Rally by GMT among the notable exceptions. But none of them really truly play like a traditional racing board game. None of them have grabbed players' imaginations and attention the way Formula D has. None of them has achieved that landmark status. 
And so in the intervening years, board games with racing elements have moved into new territory. Players today are often chasing victory points or they're climbing up and down the mountain of K2 and racing each other through the jungles of the quest for El Dorado. In each case, moving further and further from traditional roll and move mechanics and into innovative new areas. Takaido is a race along the East Sea Road, but the object is not to win the race, but just to have the nicest time. But it's the innovations of these modern games that led to one of 2016's most unexpected successes. A traditional racing board game, one that was thoroughly modern in the way it played, but eschewed the technical wonders of the motor car in favour of the humble bicycle, evoking in fact the Tour de France of the 1950s. It's called Flamme Rouge, which is French for Flamme Rouge. Flamme Rouge harks back to a simpler time, a time which allows its designers to ignore the doping scandals of recent tours and to ignore the complexities of perfectly engineered racing bikes and equally perfectly engineered athletes. It looks back to a time in which the Tour de France was nothing more than a few highly motivated men cycling up and down France. Except that's not really true. Cycling had a well-established professional scene long before the inaugural Tour de France of 1903, a professional scene so competitive that cyclists would suffer punctures from tacks thrown in front of their bikes, or they'd come down with mysterious stomach complaints and food poisoning. Bike manufacturers would seek every possible advantage for their riders, going so far as to secretly and illegally hire lower ranked riders to act as pacemen. Cheating was so rife and widespread that 12 cyclists, including the first four finishers of the second Tour de France in 1904, were all disqualified for cheating. Among other infractions, cyclists reported being attacked, sometimes by armed masked men in cars, sometimes by supporters at the roadside, while other riders avoided these attacks by taking the train. And that's not to mention the doping, which in those days consisted of cyclists drinking all manner of medical concoctions, often tempered by caffeine or wine, or both, in an attempt to find the perfect energy boost, and which led more than one competitive cyclist to be found wandering the French countryside, suffering nightmarish hallucinations. If the concoction didn't outright kill them, that is. And if you've seen Louis Malle's documentary Vive la Tour, you'll know that even up to the 1960s, cyclists were not exactly discerning about what they put in their bodies, so long as it replaced the calories they lost during the race. And this being France, cyclists would typically dive into nearby cafes and demand champagne, wine or beer, in roughly that order of preference, which they'd shove into whatever pockets they had and would subsequently chug while riding. Thanks to our new neighbours renovating the flat next door, uh, delays with deliveries, the fact that I've got a full-time job, uh, the fact that it's the Christmas period, plus any number of other little delays, uh, this video has so far taken about four weeks to film. In fact, these Christmas lights will probably come down before it's even finished. Um, that's a lot of calories. Flamme Rouge either ignores all of this context or is naively unaware of it. Regardless, appealing to a simpler era lets it be an equally simple representation of a bicycle race. And it's this simplicity which makes it the perfect marriage of theme and mechanics and therefore the perfect traditional racing board game. Which is objectively true. Like Downforce, Flamme Rouge is controlled by a deck of cards, or rather by decks of cards. You know, each player gets two, one for each of their two cyclists and each with different combinations of cards. Your ruler gets an even spread of cards that move him between three and seven spaces. Your sprinter moves two to five spaces, but also has three nines with which he'll hopefully use to break out of the pack at just the right time and strike for the finishing line just like in a real bicycle race. In each turn, you draw four cards for both your cyclists and choose one to play. And then once everybody is chosen, you flip them all over and move each cyclist in race order. 
In answer to the obvious question, there are a couple of very clever reasons why players won't just choose their highest value cards each turn. The first is that every card you play is immediately removed from the game, which means your options are being reduced the further around the track you get. Every high card you play early is a high card you don't have when the race reaches its last phase. More importantly, cyclists gain a slipstream if there's one space between them and a cyclist in front at the end of the turn, which means that if you play well, you can gain one or even two extra spaces when packs of cyclists move up, turning low cards like twos and threes into fours and fives. This might not seem much, but in a game of tight margins like Flamme Rouge, this can actually make a huge difference. And at the end of the turn, if you're not in a pack, you have to pick up an exhaustion card, a low value card that clogs up your deck because you're essentially out in front putting in all the work. So yes, your sprinter can in theory play three nines in a row and be halfway around the pack in three turns, but each turn he's out there alone, he's picking up more and more exhaustion until your deck is full of nothing but exhaustion cards and your cyclist is crawling around the track watching everybody sail off into the distance. So the way to play Flamme Rouge is the way you'd run a real cycling race, coordinating your cyclists and alternating the workload until the opportune moment, at which point your deck is probably slim enough to reliably pick out your fast cards and help you sprint for the line. With Flamme Rouge, it's possible that this time the traditional racing board game really has done all it can. Although advocates for Le Tour de France and Rallyman GT, both of which have appeared in subsequent years, might argue otherwise. But neither of those are likely to achieve the landmark status of Downforce, which many people remember playing as children and are now introducing to their own children. And they're unlikely to endure the way Formula D has endured, with its simple dice throwing, gear shifting appeal. And they're unlikely to be remembered the way Flamme Rouge will be remembered, as a perfect and perfectly simple evocation of bicycle racing. So there you go, the traditional racing board game from goose to bike. And with that, this video is finally finished and I am finally ready for the Tour de France. Yes. Okay, it's done. So we finished the, the game with the Bruce. So mm -hmm. it'll be a shot of me like a close shot of me rolling dice and finishing and then and then we have our glasses mm. and I'll say something like uh, another game excellently well played. <laughs> and then just as we're about to, to take a drink, the door's gonna burst open. Oh yeah, I hope so. <laughs> That's good that on this Yeah. Is that it's, juice? <laughs> yes. It's not real wine. <laughs> Tellement de déception, putain. Tellement de déception. <laughs>